Meetings are recorded this part of the Ragged Trouser Philanthropist for some time now. I think it says a tremendous amount. And I want to do it as a sort of a dramatic reading. So obviously you're only going to really see me looking now at the book because I cannot possibly remember it and uh, I haven't got an auto cue. Let me tell you where it's from. It begins on page 209 of the Ragged Trousers of Philanthropist by uh, Robert Tressel in the Granada edition. There's the cover of the book. As you can see, it starts from the Granada edition. Just to set the extract in a little bit of context, uh, they've been discussing for some time about the reason for poverty the reason why, even though they are currently lucky enough to be working as house painters, they know that won't last, and they know that the current job they're on, which is called uh, decorating a place called The Cave, will soon be over, and they'll be out of work again, and they'll be looking for work, and they will be living in abject poverty. Remind you of uh, Tory Britain at all? Because it does me, most definitely. And uh, the argument has been that the protagonist, Owen, has said that money is the cause of poverty. And of course his um, fellow workers are absolutely astounding. How can having money cause poverty? Well, it doesn't quite work out like that. But if you're a trade unionist in particular, and if you're a socialist, please just listen to this. And if you get a chance to read it yourself... It is absolutely brilliant. I'm going to read to you from what the, the overall chapter is called. Um, let me take it uh, from the beginning. Yeah, it's chapter 21. Chapter 21, The Reign of Terror, The Great Money Trick. And it begins with um, the, the, uh, uh, they're discussing this in their lunch break. Money is the re real cause of poverty, said Owen. Prove it, repeated Crass. Money is the cause of poverty because it, because it is the device by which those who are too lazy to work are enabled to rob the workers of the fruits of their labour. Prove it, said Crass. Owen slowly folded up the piece of newspaper he had been reading and put it into his pocket. All right, he replied. I'll show you how the great money trick is worked. Owen opened his dinner basket and took from it two slices of bread. But as these were not sufficient, he requested that anybody who had some bread left would give it up to him. They gave, it gave him several pieces, which he placed in a heap on a clean piece of paper, and having borrowed pocket knives they used to cut and eat their dinners, from Easton and Harlow and Philpot, he addressed them as follows. These pieces of bread represent the raw materials that exist naturally in and on the earth for the use of mankind. They were not meant for any human being, but, but, were, but were created by the Great Spirit for the benefit and sustenance of all, the same as were the air and the light and the sun. You're speaking about fair there, mate. You're speaking about a fair man there. I've uh, met some for... Uh, I, I, sorry, I'll just repeat that. You're about as fair speaking there, a man, as I've met for some time, said Harlow, winking at the others. Yes, mate, said Philpot. Anybody would agree that such is clear, such as that is clear as mud. Now, continued Owen, I am a capitalist or either I represent the capitalist class. That is to say, all those raw materials belong to me. It doesn't matter for our present argument how I obtain possession of them, or whether I have any real right to them. The only thing that matters now is the admitted fact that all the raw materials which are necessary for the production of the necessaries of life are now the property of the landlord and capitalist class. I am that class. All these raw materials belong to me. Good enough, agreed Philpot. Now, you three represent the working class. 
you have nothing. And for my part, although I have all these raw materials, they're of no use to me. What I need is the things that can be made out of these raw materials by work. But as I'm too lazy to work myself, I have invented the money trick to, work to make you work for me. But I must first explain that I possess something else besides the raw materials. These three knives represent all the machinery of production, the factories, tools, railways and so forth, without which the necessities of life cannot be produced in abundance. And these three coins, taking three half pennies from his pocket, represent my money capital. But before we go any further, said Owen, interrupting himself, it's most important that you remember I am not supposed to be merely a capitalist. I represent the whole capitalist class. You are not supposed to be just three workers. You represent the whole working class. All right, all right, said Crass impatiently. We all understand that. Get on with it. Owen proceeded to cut up one of the slices of bread into a number of little square blocks. These represent the things which are produced by labour, aided by machinery, from the raw materials. We will suppose that these blocks represent a week's work. We will suppose that each of these half pennies is a sovereign. We'd be able to do the trick better if we had real sovereigns, but I forgot to bring mine with me. I'd lend you some, said Philpot regretfully, but I left me purse on the grand piano. As a strange coincidence, as if by a strange coincidence, nobody happened to have any gold with them. It was decided to make the shift with the half pence. Now, this is the way the trick works. But before you, but before you goes on with it, interrupted Philpot apprehensively, don't you think we'd better have something to keep... Uh, Keep watch at the gate in case Slop comes along. We don't want to get runned in, you know. I don't think we, there's any need for that, replied Owen. Um, there's only one Slop who interferes with us playing this game, and that's police, that's police That's the police constable socialism. Never mind about socialism, said so Crass irritably. Get along with a bloody trick. Owen now addressed himself to the working classes as represented by Philpot, Harlow and Easton. You say that you're all in need of employment and I'm a kind-hearted capital I'm I'm part of the kind-hearted class, capitalist class, so I'm going to invest all of my money in various industries and give you plenty of work. I shall pay you each one pound for week uh, one pound per week and uh, uh, and it's for a week's work. You must each produce these three square blocks. For doing this work, you will each receive your wages. The money will be your own to do with as you like. And all the things you produce will, of course, be mine to do with as I like. You will each take one of these machines, and as soon as you've done your day, your week's work, you shall have your money. The working class, accordingly, set to work. And the capitalist class sat down and watch them. As soon as they'd finished, they passed the nine little blocks to Owen, who placed them on a piece of paper by his side and paid the workers their wages. These blocks represent the necessities of life. You can't live without some of these things, but as they belong to me, you will have to buy them from me. My price for these blocks is one pound each. As the working class were in need of the necessities of life, and they could not eat, drink, or wear useless money, they were compared to compelled to agree to the kind capitalist terms. They each bought, they each bought Mac and consumed one third of the produce of their labour. The capitalist class also devoured two square blocks, and so the net result of a week's work was that the kind capitalist had consumed two pounds worth of the things produced by la the labour of others, and reckoning the squares at their market value of one pound each, he had doubled his capital, 
for he possessed three pounds in money in addition to four pounds worth of goods. As the working classes, Philpot, Harlow and Easton, having each produced a pound's worth of the necessities they had bought with their wages, they were again precisely in exactly the same condition as when they started work. They had nothing. The process was repeated several times. For each week's work, the producers were paid their wages. They kept on working and spending all of their earnings. The the kind-hearted capitalist consumed twice as much as any one of them, and his pile of wealth was continually increased. In a little while, reckoning the little squares at their market value of one pound each, he was worth about one hundred pounds, and the working classes were still in the same position as when they be- as when they began, and they were still tearing into their work as if their lives depended on it. After a while, the rest of the rest of the crowd began to laugh, and their merriment increased when the kind-hearted capitalist, just after having sold a pound's worth of necessities to each of his workers, suddenly took their tools, the machinery of production, the knives away from them, and informed them that owing to overproduction. All of his storehouses were glutted with the necessities of life, and he decided to close down the works. "'Well, and what the bloody hell are we going to do now?' demanded Philpot. "'It's not my business,' replied the kind-hearted capitalist. "'I've paid you your wages and provided you with plenty plenty of work for a long time past. "'I have no more work for you to do at present. "'Come round again in a few months and I'll see what I can do for you.' "'But what about the necessities of life?' demanded Harlow. We must have something to eat. Of course you must, said the capitalist affably, and I shall be very pleased to sell you some. But we ain't got no bloody money. Well, you can't expect me to give you my goods for nothing. You didn't work for me for nothing, you know. I paid for your work, and you should have saved a little something. You should have been thrifty like me. Look how, how, how I have got on by being thrifty. You can't add to that, can you? It's the story of how it works. It's the story of the success of capitalism at the the expense and by exploiting sheer exploitation. The workers start back with the same amount or less. The capitalist more than, uh, well, a hundred times worth as much wealth. Yeah, and then when he doesn't need the workers anymore, (laughs) bye-bye, bye-bye workers, I've got enough now, bye-bye, bye-bye, go away and starve. And then, typical of the Tories, they have the gall to say to them, well, you should have saved, you should have exhibited the virtue of thrift. Billionaires telling ordinary working people to be thrifty, to save for a rainy day. Nothing has changed since then. Nothing. Everything the Tories do is based on the great money trick. If you're working, you're being tricked. It's the great money trick trick. It's being played at this exact second. If you've taken time off for your lunch and you've listened to that in your lunch hour or your lunch half hour more likely or quarter of an hour more likely, you're being played. The capitalist and the landlord class are using you. They're using you to build up great wealth and luxury, to enjoy all the things your labour has made, and they won't even pay you properly for your labour. Socialism. That's what this book is about. Socialism, comrades. Socialism. Take it up with me. Take it up with the Labour Party. Become a socialist. Live as a socialist. Live for the many, not the few. 
We'll win, comrades. We'll win.